inclusion. Inclusion podcast by the Centre for Inclusive Leadership. Hello and welcome to this latest edition of Inclusion Podcast. I'm so pleased you've joined us and I'm even happier that today my dear friend Pamela Hutchinson has joined us. So Pamela, hello, how are you? I'm really good, thank you. It's great to be here in conversation with you. I'm thrilled to bits. So for those of you who might not know who Pamela Hutchinson is, Pamela Hutchinson OBE, should I say, is... Pamela is the Global Head of Diversity and Inclusion at Bloomberg. In addition to which, you've got a whole load of other titles, haven't you? Mm -hmm. I think you're on the board of Employers Board of Kings, right? Yes, correct. Uh, You are a trustee of Anna Freud. Correct. And you're SEO on the board there? Board director, yes. Board director. So how do you do all that? Not easily. (laughs) I was going to say. And then you've got this small matter of raising a family. So you're a busy lady. But thank you for taking time out to be with us because I know how crazy busy you are. So I super appreciate that. Um, I'd like to start, if I can, by talking about the OBE. I mean, it's, that's a big deal, right? How did you how did you feel when you were awarded the OBE for your work? It's not like you weren't awarded it for social justice work and you got a lot of social justice credits, but you were awarded this for your work in DNI in the corporate environment. So that's quite a big deal. I'm not sure how many people have got that. So how did it make you feel when you when you got the award? Um, it was very odd to receive an award for doing my day job. <laughs> doing your job. Um, it, it just felt very strange mm-hmm. indeed, actually. I do this work because it's a passion. It's um, it, it fulfill, fulfills mm-hmm, me. Mm-hmm. It's, um, it's, I hope, part of my legacy, actually, doing sure. this work. So it was really odd, but um, there was a whole load of emotion, emotion mixed up in mm-hmm. that, from sadness, because both my parents were not here to see oh. me receive it. Um, I felt a little bit of a sellout, if I'm completely honest. You, really? um, you know, the British Empire feel, you know, has, doesn't really make me feel warm and cuddly when I think about it. Um, so that felt a little odd too. Um, but my husband was sort of put me straight really and said, Pamela, get over yourself. This is not about you. This <laughs> is about everyone behind you um, who has any ambition of, of achieving great things. And seeing you um, receive an OBE uh, allows others to think that they can they can do it too. So... That's brilliant. And, and you know, I know firsthand how massively well received it was at Bloomberg, for example, just amongst your team. It was almost as if you'd almost won it for them, right? And run it for all of the work right. you've done. And not only the Bloomberg teams, but all the organizations you've worked in before. It's a big, it's a big thing. Yeah. It's a big thing. I'll come back to the get over yourself, Pamela, bit in a minute. Mm-hmm. Well done, Charlie, for that, by the way. But let me talk about mum and dad. You said that that's a sadness for you. What, what would it have meant for them? Oh, gosh. Uh, so much, so much. Um, You know, much like many people who came from the Caribbean to the Mm -hmm. UK, um, they came, one, to answer the call. Uh, Let's not forget, they were invited. Um, They answered the call. (laughs) Lest we should forget. (laughs) Yeah. Um, But they were also, you know, they came here to have a better life for themselves Mm -hmm. and for their children as well. Mm -hmm. Um, And everything they did was sort of, you know, to to, um, enable us to to, to thrive as children Mm -hmm. and to um, achieve things that perhaps they were not able to. So um, everything that we ever did as kids, my parents were on the sidelines cheering for us. And so I know that if my mum and dad were alive, they would have just been like beside themselves. My dad would have bought every single newspaper that he could have got his hand on and handed them out. And my mum would have told everybody Uh. um, that I had uh, uh, achieved an uh, an OBE. Um, And you know, as kids, all kids, they just want to make their parents proud. And for everything they did for me, I wanted to say, look, this is what I achieved for you. It's wonderful. What about your boys? How did they, how did they receive it? It's funny, like most teachers, well, actually, I've got a 21-year-old and a 17-year-old. And like a lot of young people, so they weren't particularly they were so impressed. Right? Yeah. <laughs> well, I say that, that's not probably not absolutely accurate because I've won quite a few awards in my time. Yeah, sure. And mostly it's like, meh. You know, it doesn't really mean too much to them. But um, when they realised that I had won an OBE, that was the first time they and probably the last time Brilliant. they'll ever be proud of their mum. Oh, I tell that. Um, I tell and, that. you know, my son had taken to social media and said, oh, my really? eldest, 
Um, and my youngest son had told everyone because every time I saw a teacher or somebody that worked, with, you know, was in his sort of sphere, they all said, oh, congratulations. So he, um, they were both very, very proud and my husband equally as proud. I remember reading uh, your husband's post on LinkedIn and oh, it, yes. was, it was just beautiful it was like it was such a lovely moment as you read that and I thought oh that's just joyous that is really joyous yeah. it was a lovely post tell me a little bit about the conflict you say you felt a little bit conflicted about it because empire which I kind of understand yeah I mean the work that I do it's about it's about inclusion it's about mm -hmm. justice mm -hmm. it's about diversity and when I think about what the British empire stood for Sure. It was very difficult for me in the work that I do to accept it with every, with the history that went alongside it. Now, I've always said it shouldn't be an OBE, Order of the British Empire, but the Order of British Excellence. Now, if I had no, got that, nice. I would have felt pretty cool about that. That's nice. That's um, nice. But yeah, it, I was conflicted and it, it did... It took me a minute before I sort of signed the paperwork and said, yes, I will accept this. And even when I did, you know, there was there was a slight, if I'm honest, a bit of embarrassment. Isn't that interesting? I was talking to uh, an, another very good friend of mine who also has an OB. He got it for uh, services and social justice. And we were talking about, in fact, I was talking about him yesterday, mm. which we were having dinner. And he was saying he felt this sense of conflict around it. And he said to me, oh, what would you do if you were, you, he, he, he kind of raised the bar with me. He said, what would you do if you were given a knighthood for your work? And I said, I'd accept it. So I said, but I actually said, no, seriously, I could, I think for me, there would be enough of a sense of deficit that I would go, oh, I feel validated because of this. Right. I said, I'd have to own that. And I'd, I'd be really honest and have to own that. But I think the thing that would be a stronger drive for me would be that I know that would give me access and it would give me a different platform and a different a, a op opportunities to really talk about yes. the things that matter to me. And I, I think that's given you a, uh, it doesn't, hasn't made you any better than you were before, but it's given you a recognition and a potentially. It does, but I wouldn't necessarily agree that, well, at least for me, that it's given me a platform. I think I already have the had platform it, yeah. you had it. by virtue of being, of working for the companies that I've worked that's for in true. the past. That's true. So I don't necessarily think it, credentializes me. No, that's a lie, I don't think. That's because you're not as vacuous as I am. That's you. <laughs> <laughs> you need to, do need to bear that in mind. <laughs> you're, you're, on, you're in that seat. Yeah. I'm the one that's like, yeah. I, I, but then that's, that's really powerful. My, my friend was similar. He's, he, he took the same view. He just said, I want to be recognized for who I am. But it was an interesting, and it's interesting to hear you say the same thing as well, because I think maybe that's part of the characteristic of people that are very accomplished and very successful in their work. It's kind of just part of the thing, which is in, which is in, which I think is great, which I think is great. So I shall reflect on that. <laughs> Tell me a little bit about the work, if I may, because I know you've spoken very passionately about particularly invisible uh, exclusion, and I think that's been very interesting. So I've read you and listened to you talk about things like particularly women's health issues. I think you were very early to the conversation, for example, about menopause, which mm -hmm. was an interesting one to see. I remember you wrote that pa paper on that. I thought. Okay, this is gonna this is gonna start a conversation, and a slew of articles have come out since then. You've talked about menstrual health, etc. Um, but tell me about how, and you're in the corporate space. What can organisations do to perhaps make their cultures and their environments more inclusive around some of these invisible issues? Do you think? Yeah. Um, well. One of the things that we do at Bloomberg are uh, what we call inclusion dialogues. Mm -hmm. And the inclusion dialogues are a way to bring people together to talk about things that aren't typically talked about in the workplace, that perhaps are a bit challenging or difficult to talk about. And the idea is to bring different perspectives to a table, to just hear and listen and and create space for all opinions. And um, the inclusion dialogues have been great for us as a way of um, bubbling up issues that aren't typically talked about or even thought about. Um, and so um, what I think is really important with creating a sense of inclusion is to allow all voices the space um, to, um, and, and this is particularly difficult now, I think, because 
Of course, what we're seeing in the US is we're now seeing sort of a real clampdown on anti DEI legislation in the US. You're talking about the Ever, um, Ever it, Bloom, the, yes, the, the Fair Act, the Fair Thing. Absolutely, yeah. with um, you know affirmative action in, mm -hmm. in universities, mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. not to mention a number of different states, particularly in the South. Now stopping, you know, curtailing rights around DNI. Um, I was reading something just at the weekend about um, in Florida um, them actually clamping down on a psychology course because it I'm talked serious. about LGBTQ. I mean, so we're we're starting to see this real clamping down on L, uh, on um, DEI. Not just in the US though. We have our own version of that in we the do. UK. Although, yeah, in fairness, we haven't got any legislation mm. in place mm. yet. But you know what? this space yeah, yeah. so we're seeing this happening all around the world and this this sense of there's a um, there is one perspective and you can't have a, a you know you can't have a different perspective mm -hmm. and that's what's happened with this kind of notion of anti wokeism um, yeah, and that frustrates me because I always think to myself it's not wokery is it it's about being awake it's about being awake to what real correct. issues are for people and it frustrates me that language I agree but I think we're in danger in the DNI space, DEI space, of silencing voice, certain voices. And hence some of these invisible hence, issues. Yeah, at, yes, but also he, hence why I think we're seeing this kind of rise of anti wokeism, right? Because we're silencing some voices oh, in the conversation. Saying. And so it, it's interesting because I struggle a little bit with this, if I'm completely honest, because I have certain perspectives that I believe mm -hmm. and certain perspectives that I, I uh, talk about. But I also appreciate there are people that think differently to me about what I believe. And is it right for me to stop them having a voice and a perspective in an environment mm. like the workplace? Now, of course, if they are discriminatory, they're sure. not treating people with respect and all those things, of course, there is no place for that. But is it my place to tell people how to think and what to believe? And is there space for all opinions? Now, one of the things, the reason I brought in the inclusion dialogues is what we do with those is that we create a space where all opinions can be heard, um, but it's it's a space for coming together and collectively coming up with a agenda to move something forward. Mm -hmm. And so it's important to have voices that are different in that conversation. Well, I agree. I agree. Because I think the thing is that the I think one of the mistakes around this conversation is that the the very notion of diversity is about difference, right? It's about inviting cognitive diversity, right. other ways of thinking. But the thing that makes the inclusion aspect so profoundly important to this is inclusion is about, by definition, it's about non-judgment and it's right. about acceptance. So actually what you're not trying to do is you're not trying to look for uniformity, you're looking for unity, aren't you? Correct. You're looking for us to be able to, I want to hear what your perspective is and I'll be able to honour that and not feel threatened by it. But equally, I want you to be able to Correct. see me and hear me with what I, and surely we're going to get richer as a result of that. Right. But we are very polarised and I think this is Correct. the point that you're making, which I think is a really strong one. If I was to, to take you back to these, I'm just curious about these invisible um, exclusions because I think they're really interesting. And I would... Curious to know, for example, something like particularly in the professional world where the gender agenda has been such a strong one. If you start talking, when you started talking about issues, for example, about menopause, did you find that that permissioned people to actually go, oh, my goodness, I can talk about this? Or did, what, did, what, what happened as a result of that? Yeah, absolutely. Um... Um, particularly on menopause, which I've written about, um, what I was finding is you would hear pockets of women talking about menopause in the organisation sort of behind closed doors yeah, and in I secret. Imagine. I can imagine And it that. wasn't something, you know, something that we spoke openly about. And um, I heard enough people talking about it to think, come on, Pamela, you're the head of DNI. Like, if you Speak can't up. talk about your own experience yeah, of menopause, yeah, yeah, yeah. then, you know, you're not really being authentic to who wow. you are. Wow. Uh, and so I, I started having conversations. And then it's funny, once you start having conversations, people start coming out of the woodwork. To your point, you permission them to, to be able to, to, to speak openly. And, um, and as we started kind of coming together in numbers, um, then you know, we felt strong enough as a, as a group to be able to have that conversation with the wider um, wider uh, organisation, which we did. And, you know, it's it was still, I, I remember when I wrote the blog that went onto LinkedIn, um, I had uh, 
a group of my girlfriends said to me, don't be crazy now. Oh, seriously? Don't put that out there. Everyone thinks that you've got it together. Don't give men wow. another reason to think that women aren't good enough or shouldn't be in wow. senior roles. So I had that kind of group of people saying that. And then on the other side, I had another group of people saying, you're exactly, if you talk about it, you'll open the door for others. And importantly, a lot of my black friends were saying, we don't ever hear black women talk about this. And it's important for you to so be able good. to be visible to black women. All the conversations I'd ever spoken or heard or uh, seen written about were by white women. And so I just, and then of course, it's as was what usually happens with me is my husband sort of says, <laughs> get over yourself. <laughs> this and is Charlie's just, role in life, isn't it? It's his role in life. <laughs> Get over yourself and do it, and I and so I did. I I, I did the, the and and you know you build it and they will come and they and everyone are. really did and and then you start to normalise it. Once you start to normalise it, then you invite others, men, into the conversation, and 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 it's just taken off. And I think the same is true for many of the things that I talk about that are about being invisible. Whether it's neurodiversity, mm -hmm. I have a child who has neurodiversity, who's neurodiverse. Again, uh, sometimes these are invisible, but if you talk about it, um, you, cr you permission others to step forward and then you create an environment where other people can participate and learn, become aware, engage, and then, then it lifts off. I think that's really helpful for me because I think this is what I mean about position and using your permission, your position, because for me, um, something like what you just described mm. is essentially you opening a door for the conversation, but you've put your own story in there which wedges the door open, right? So that right. door now can't be closed because you've wedged it open. Mm -hmm. uh, and two things I was wanted just to check on, because I mean, you said two things that are particularly interesting to me there. One, you talked about the idea of, come on, Pamela, I'm the global head of BNI. If I can't be authentic about this, who can? How much responsibility do you feel as the global head of BNI and so visible to be authentic about your stuff? Hugely. Do you? Yeah. Do you? We can't go out preaching about being authentic if we're not. I hear you. I mean, I it, it took a while, I though, I'll you. be honest, you know. Sometimes I think there's way too much of me out there. And that <laughs> makes me uncomfortable. Does it? Oh, yes, it does make me uncomfortable. But I also recognise that I have a responsibility as the global head of mm. DNI and i mm. to open and wedge that door for mm. others. Really and nice. um and yeah, and, and so I, I do it. I, I mean, obviously I don't tell everybody everything, but I do share a lot of who I am. And I think that's important because people connect with that. I remember writing something um, during uh, Disability Month about my son and, and what it's like to be a parent of a mm, child with mm, neuro, mm. With, who, who, who is neurodiverse. I read that, I read that too. <laughs> and um, I can't tell you how many I mean, actually, more than the number of responses I got for the menopause um, blog, just from all over the world saying, thank you for, for thank sharing you. that. Thank you for, like, you know, being honest about how difficult that is. But also, thank you for being optimistic. It's beautiful. I, I love it. I really love it. The other thing I just wanted to ask you about, um, perhaps I'm asking a question or make a statement saying whether or not this is fair or, or not. You talked earlier about, about the gender diversity and you were talking about black women and permissioning black women. Is it a fair assessment to say that gender diversity has essentially been about the advancement of white women as opposed to the advancement of black women? Yeah, I think it's fair to say that. Um, I've, I've spent a lot of time on different stages talking about that, actually. Mm -hmm. um, you know, um, Inadvertently, I think it has done that. I don't think anyone set out to say, right, we're, you know, we're going to push forward with the gender agenda, but we're only going to push forward for yeah. white women. I don't think anyone intended that no, to happen. That. Um, but the reality is that most of these organisations have been headed up by senior women. And in the main, senior women have been white women. And um, inadvertently, they look around their own networks, they're majority, majority white women. And that's where the agenda has focused. But again, I don't think anyone went set out to do that. Um, 
Uh, but I've always said, you know, as, and I said this even last year when I was looking at the numbers of women that has ascended onto boards. Mm. And I said, we should be very careful here and, and not pat ourselves on the back because we've achieved the percentage of women in boards that we had set out to. Because um, it should be all women, not some women. And then, until oh, we have that. all women, we have not achieved the goal, uh, the gender diversity goal. So I say that often, all of us, not some of us. No, I love that. I love that. I mean, for me, inclusion is about all of us, isn't it? Right. Not only is it about all of us, but it's created by all of us. Correct. I wonder when I think about inclusion, so we have a definition, which I know you know, but I'm interested to see what you would say about it. So when we think about inclusion at the centre, we talk about the idea of these coming together with these various sentiments. So to be respected, to be valued, to be trusted, mm -hmm. to feel psychologically safe, to feel a sense of belonging, to be able to see my best, be my best self, authentic, I guess, mm -hmm. and then to be able to do my best work. Right. Which of those matters the most to you? So respect, valued, mm -hmm. safe, trusted, belonging, best self, or best work? Gosh, they're all good. I know they are. That's why I don't we know if wrote I could them. pick one. <laughs> Which would be, um, what would be the most important stand that one to I you? think if I were going to pick one, it would probably be psychologically safe. Really? Yes. Tell me why. I think um, if I can be myself, mm -hmm. if I can be authentic mm -hmm. and um, and I am safe in who I am, I can do amazing things. That is lovely. And I know that I can do amazing things. I have worked in environments where I have not felt psychologically safe. And trust me, I have never done my best work in those environments. That's very powerful. Um, and when I feel my true self, when I'm authentic to who I am, where I can speak without fear of retribution, where I can do things without fear of being blamed, I'm on, I'm on fire in those I love environments. It. So yeah, being psychologically safe, powerful. I think, would be important to me. And, and from a corporate point of view, if I'm looking for innovation, looking for all the kind of stuff that organisations like yours look for, presumably that's a profoundly important aspect of inclusion, Absolutely. right? Absolutely. Absolutely. important. Tell me, Pamela, if I was, uh, if you wanted to give some advice to, I don't know, I'm a young person perhaps coming, coming into the industry for the first time and I might be sort of wide-eyed and idealistic about what I'm going to do within DNI, what would your counsel what would your advice be mm -hmm. to maybe to your younger self perhaps coming into the space what would you be saying yeah i probably would say are you resilient enough for this wow really <laughs> yeah it's it is a difficult job um you know you are um campaigning for the underrepresented at the same time you don't want to ignore, ignore the majority and it's such a difficult mm. balance to get. Mm. Throughout my career, I have been, I have been criticised by the majority for, fo for, for focusing on the minority. And I've been criticised by the minority for not oh. focusing enough on the minority. Oh, yeah. Uh, and, um, yeah, it, it's, I wish, I think I came into this a bit sort of bright-eyed and bushy-tailed and thought that people would just get it that it made common sense, that the business case was there, and that, you know, all I needed really was to be able to influence um, and coach and guide. And I realise now, having done this for almost 30 years, that it's a little bit tougher than that. And, it sure is. Um, you know, I would say to anybody thinking about coming into this, you know, this is, you've, you've got to be it's got to be more than just passion because there's lots of people that are passionate about DNI. Because when the going gets hard, is that passion going to sustain you to keep going? Yeah. Um, so so just sort of being resilient, um, the courage of your convictions, being able to name the elephant in the room um, when others can't. And that's, again, I thought I could do that when I first came into this and then realised when I was in those rooms, it wasn't so easy to be so courageous. So, um, yeah, I think having the courage of your convictions, being resilient, um, like uh, also I think it, what's really important is having a passion for this work that transcends your day job. <laughs> Yeah, that's really interesting, isn't it? Because I'm listening to you, and as I'm hearing you, I'm thinking, 
uh, yeah, I'm just cheering you on, quietly listening, but thinking to myself, I don't think you should come into this if, you, if you're looking for a job. Right. <laughs> because I don't think this is a job. No. This feels much more missional to it's me. It's right. It's a calling. Yeah, it's it a really calling. Is. That's exactly right. It's a calling. Right. And it's very vocational. And I think that if you miss that sense of vocation, if you miss that intrinsic sense of purpose this mm. is not the right thing for you to be absolutely doing absolutely not it mm. really is I agree and, with and that. you know i see people come and go from this 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 uh this field of work i've also seen people come in and not been able to deal with just everything coming the world is changing so rapidly um around you and you're having to sort of deal with what's going on outside and deal with what's going on inside I mean, there are so many skills you need to have with this job. It's just phenomenal. Somebody, I recently had my performance appraisal um, at Bloomberg and my boss said, someone wrote in here, Pamela is a psychologist, a lawyer, um, a uh, um, a visionary and he just went on listing all these different sort of skills that you need in order to do this job. Um, and you really need all you of really them. Need them. Do, you know, do you know what I will, a couple of questions before we finish because it's fascinating talking to you by the way um you've managed to do something very unusual which is that everybody that i know loves you they all <laughs> love you it doesn't matter who i talk to nobody can say a bad word of you but what's really interesting is you still tell everybody the truth so how do you manage to be universally loved by everybody but to your earlier point when you first went into those boardrooms you didn't tell people the truth you do now don't you oh gosh yeah so how do you pull that off um, I think sometimes age helps, if I'm completely honest. Um, uh, as I've got older, I've probably cared less about what people think of me when I walk into rooms. Um, but um, in all seriousness, I, I think what I do is um, I'm not afraid to be vulnerable. Nice. And so I will go into a room and I will share something about myself, which kind of helps them to mm -hmm. feel safe, right? Because I've just shared something... Sometimes it's something personal. Sometimes it's just a bit of a revelation. Maybe it's something they don't know about me. Um, and I think sort of uh, bringing the temperature down in the room, yes. that helps um, uh, by me just, just being vulnerable. And often when I'm vulnerable and they're safe, they then feel comfortable to share something about themselves. And then I can really get into a conversation with someone. And I've tried that many times with leaders who let's say it isn't on the, aren't on the same page as me in terms of thinking. And I've had to go in and coach them and I've known it was going to be a difficult coaching conversation. So I always start with, let me tell you something about me that you don't know. It's really important, I think, for people to realise that just because I'm the head of DNI, I'm not perfect. I really am not. I have the same insecurities, vulnerabilities, biases as everybody wow. else. And I think it's important for, for people to see that in me, not feel like, you know, that they're sort of in the presence of Jesus or something. <laughs> <laughs> but you know what? That's an important thing to say, though, because I think we do, and you could easily sort of set an impossible standard for people to reach up to, right? But actually by being human and being vulnerable... Mm then what is beautiful about that is you suddenly create the environment where we can actually have a conversation when we say, okay, masks off. Right, correct. And then we can have a real conversation. Right, absolutely. I love that. Very helpful. And that's very interesting because, I mean, that's good advice for practitioners as well because I think there's a lot of, um, and there'll be a lot of DNI practitioners that are watching this uh, podcast and be thinking to myself, you know, they're, they're butting themselves up against walls. They're not necessarily getting the hearing. They're not necessarily at the top tables. Um, but actually that advice I think is really, really, really helpful. And I, I like the idea of the safety bit. And I, you are a massive empath, right? That shows up everywhere you go. And I think there's something for me, as I observe, and I've observed lots of people in your role, um, I think there is something about that notion that actually people don't really care how much you know unless they know how much you care. Right, right. And you do lead with care, don't you? And because you lead that such a strong suit of yours um, that I kind of, even if I don't really want to hear what you've got to say, I'm going to listen because I'd be pretty stupid. Tell me finally about legacy. What, what would you like your, your legacy and you, when, you, when you finally decide... Okay, I've done my time. <laughs> what would you like your legacy to be? That I made a difference. And I don't care. It doesn't have to be for millions. Even if I made a difference for a handful of people, and that, that's just making a difference. You made a difference. Well, I can certainly find out more than a handful of people you've made a difference to. <laughs> 
I hope really, so. I really, I really can. I love what you said about when you feel safe. I thought there was a beautiful moment where you talked about when you feel safe. You can do anything. And there's a real thing about that. I just wonder, and perhaps this would be a real encouragement for the folks that are just watching this podcast, that when you think about that, if you can remove self-doubt, if you can just stand in that place of knowing who you are, be confident about who you are, nothing is impossible for mm. us. And, you know, when I've, I've had the privilege of, of following Pamela's career for some time and I, you know, know what she's done, what she's achieved, but I think that, that note of just letting that self-doubt go and knowing that everything is possible it's amazing what you can achieve. Pamela Hutchinson, OBE, what a <laughs> privilege it's been to have you with us today. So thank you so much for stopping by. We really appreciate thank it. Thank you. You're very welcome. <laughs>